Um, nobody has any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, will you ever do a uh, presentation on uh, Word software? Just, is that a possibility? On Word processing? On word processing. Yeah, um, on Word, you know, how to maneuver around Word. Specifically Microsoft Word or just Word processing in general? Or Microsoft Word. Um, I could. Um, <laughs> I used the very first version of Microsoft Word on the Mac back in 1984. Uh, my dear spouse, who was a uh, lieutenant commander in the Navy at the time, she flew back to the United States. Uh, we were living in Japan at the time. She flew back to the United States and when she came back to Japan, she had a copy of Microsoft Word. It came on two uh, three and a half inch diskettes and I've been using Word ever since then. But I don't use that same version. But um, um, I've also been a photojournalist and run a newspaper. I have used Word a lot. Um, so sure, I could do that if, uh, if there's a... There's an I, I got the, the Microsoft uh, um, where it's got the Word and PowerPoint and the works, but I'm having a hard time maneuvering around on the Word. Um, I mean, on, excuse me, the uh, Excel, um, you know, figuring out cells and all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, with Excel, uh, I'm not really an expert on Excel. Kathleen is. I've used Excel extensively, but Kathleen's the, uh, she's done things. Uh, the very first spreadsheet out there was called VisiCalc, and it was uh, premiered at the West Coast Computer Fair in San Francisco in 1978. And Kathleen happened to stop by the, the booth the day that, that they announced it. And they showed me what it would do. And I thought, OK, I don't care. I could write a program to do this. And Kathleen sat there, and I sat down with them, and she played with it for an hour. And the, um, one of the developers, a guy named Dan Bricklin, um, sat there with her as she was playing with it and she said oh you could use this for creating a schedule uh, and he said no you can't and then she proceeded to create a schedule have it automatically count uh, out hours and dates and so on and so forth and Dan Bricklin was very kind of surprised and upset because he invented it to be used by accountants and had no idea that anyone would ever want to use it for anything other than accounting so she's been using it for a long time. But with, when, it, when it comes to Word, I know a great deal about it. Uh, she's more of the... It'd be nice to have a presentation on Word, how to maneuver around it sometime. Okay. Um, we can definitely give that some thought. Um, any other questions? Um, I had a question for you. Since we're going to be talking about um, digital photography today, I wanted to ask you, how many of you have an iPhone? Yes. Pretty much everybody. Yes. How many, of you, much. how many of you have a case for your iPhone? Yes, yeah. I do. What, what anyone, do you mean by a case? Well, it, it, it comes, the iPhone just comes as an iPhone and you can buy a case to put around it so that if you drop it, it protects it. Okay. And the reason why I ask is that I am shocked at the number of people I see who have iPhones who don't have cases. And you really don't want to do that because anything this small, you will drop at some point. And if you mm -hmm. drop it, uh, the case does protect it uh, quite a bit. The case that I recommend, by the way, is the cheapest one that Apple sells. It's this uh, kind of rubberized one that uh, fits on the uh, iPhone. I've had um, some from, um, what's, I can't remember the name of the company. Uh, Pelican has some. Pelican makes great cases and some, and I have some armored cases. Uh, all of those are good as well, but the problem I've had with them is they create a lot of bulk and I tend to carry it in my shirt pocket. And if it's really bulky and hard to get in my shirt pocket, it kind of defeats the point of having it stay in my shirt pocket where it's protected. So I wanted to ask that because I saw somebody today drop their phone on Washington Street, Washington, I guess it is Street, and swim 
and I watched it fly away in several pieces. It wasn't an iPhone, it was an Android, but um, it doesn't make any difference. You, you, you do want to make sure that uh, you hold on to it. A lot of the things that people kind of misunderstand how much these things cost, like Apple will say that, you know, this one costs $6.99 or $7.99 or whatnot, but um, these have a one-year guarantee that you can extend to two years and you pay a monthly fee for data and all the other things for the phone. The average cost of a phone is around two grand. So it's a, it's a substantial investment if you include all of, the, all of the charges that you pay monthly for your phone and data and all the rest of that. These are actually quite expensive. So having a case for your phone is something that, uh, if I forget to mention it later on, I want to just ask right now, because you definitely want to have a a case for your I have an otter, otter box and I really like it. Yes, the otter box is excellent. I have a friend who has a specialized case and I can't remember the name of it, but it floats. And uh, in his case, he has a shell. A shell is a, is a racing rowboat. It's very long and narrow. And he was out on the Potomac one day and his wife called and he picked it up and he fumbled it and it fell into the Potomac River. And since then, he's had a case that floats. So he's got kind of specialized need there, but, um, but it's just something that normally protects it from falling on something hard rather than falling into a river. Um, you definitely want to have one of these. Because um, again, it's, it will ruin your whole day if you drop it on the concrete and it shatters. Um, I wanted to mention again the, some things about how to use Zoom. If you look down at the bottom, it has the number of participants. If you click that, it'll, li it'll list them off on the side. And right ne next to where it says participants, there's a button that says chat. And if you open up the chat window, which will be down below the participants, I've pasted in the URL of a form that you can go to, and it's an attendance form. It'll allow you to say that you attended this meeting. Uh, and also the last two meetings because we forgot to take attendance. So uh, if you could fill out the attendance form, that would be great because I really can't tell when people log in who they are. Like, for example, uh, earlier, well, uh, I, I just can't tell necessarily from the names and I don't want to take attendance. So just fill out the form and that'll save me some trouble. The other issue that we had is we had some sign-in sheets in the past and I couldn't read people's handwriting. So if you fill out the form, I don't have to worry about that because it's on a computer. Um, any questions? Because we still have well, 10 minutes or so before the meeting starts. Yeah, yes. Lawrence. Um, I thought you said that the Microsoft Word would, if you upgraded to Catalina, that it would not work on that. Oh, uh, no. The, what I said was somebody last meeting had Word uh, 2011, and Word 2011 is written as a 32-bit app, and if you upgrade to Catalina and you click on it, nothing happens, because mm -hmm. Catalina and all operating systems past Catalina are 64-bit only, and they will not run a 32-bit app. Uh, so the... Um, you don't, you want, Catalina requires 32, requires 64-bit apps. And Office 365 is 64-bit, uh, but uh, Office uh, 2011 is definitely not. Um, and it's also got a whole bunch of security bugs in it. So um, okay. you definitely don't, if you have Office 2011 or Word 2011, it won't work with Catalina. But if you have okay. a couple newer ones will, but Office 365 is the current version and that works just fine. And it's also not that expensive. Okay, and then um, on taking photos, do you have any words of wisdom for people with tremors? Um, in fact, I do. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, some things to do with taking uh, photos today. But remind me again if I don't get to that, because yes, I, I'm going to have some specifics. I'm going to, I'm going to sneak into talking about um, uh, some more fundamental things about the digital photography first, and then I'm going to talk about some uh, very specific. 
digital photography is something that we could talk about every month for the rest of the year because um, everybody has a camera now because they have a, a smartphone and we take tons of photos and um, most of those photos are terribly bad and that's because either they're bad because it's a bad photo or it's a bad photo because they took a picture of something that nobody cares about it might be useful to you as an example when Kathleen goes to uh, when, when Kathleen goes to Costco and she says do you want this brand of olives or this brand of olives? Um, it, she can take a picture of the tag and just send it to me via email. Well, that's a useful picture, but it is not a good photo. And we take useful pictures all the time. For example, at, um, at work, um, when I was working, I, had, I ran web servers for the federal government and I'd have these big web servers in these racks in land rooms and every year I had to take inventory and when you're taking inventory they insisted that you actually look at the, the uh, both the property tag which sensible people would stick on the front so um, on National Ocean Service was part of the Department of Commerce so it had a Department of Commerce property tag but they also wanted you to look at the uh, serial number and the serial number on computers is usually in the back and if they're in these big racks I would have to turn, I would have to shut down web servers that people were using, take them out of the rack to see the serial number. And one day I refused to do that. One day I had the bright idea that I could just stick my iPhone behind the rack and take a photograph of the back of the rack to take the serial number, to get the serial number. So we use our iPhones for taking photos all the time, but they're not good photos. They're useful photos. So I don't know how many of you have friends and relatives who post on Facebook pictures of the dinner that they just had. I have no mm -hmm. idea why anyone would do that. Those are bad <laughs> photos, but they might be useful. You know, like I just, uh, I just uh, finished a marathon and I ate all these hot dogs or whatever it is. It might, it might tell a story, but for the most part, those aren't good photos. So there's a difference between a useful photo that we all take uh, and a, uh, a good photo and a good photo has some kind of has some kind of merit and I'm going to talk about uh, that today as well um, but if I don't ask if I don't answer, answer the question about how to take a steady photo well, remind me and uh, and I'll do so Lawrence Yes. Tell me about the uh, third uh, photo uh, by, I think it's uh, in the newer ones that uh, have a telephoto. Yes. Tell me about it. Well, that's the first thing I'm going to do when I start the presentation. Is I'm going to show you the same photo taken with uh, three different cameras. And one of them is uh, my iPhone 11, um, Pro Max, which is a really stupid name, but it's got the three lenses. So when I'm, I'll do, I'll do that as part of the uh, presentation and uh, I'll explain what they are at the time. So I'm gonna do that as, as soon as we start up the, the meeting. And okay. I have to remember to both, um, do my presentation and also admit people to the meeting. Speaking of which, um, we're probably going to be on Zoom for a while because uh, I don't know if you know, if you heard the news, but Clallam County, which was in the low infection rate for most of the year, uh, this week went into the high infection rate. So we kind of we were in medium for a very short period of time, and then we went into high. Uh, we've had one death, and the rate of uh, infection has reached the point where we're gonna be in high for a while. So I don't anticipate that we're gonna have any meetings in person for um, months. Exactly how long that is, um, I, I can't tell you. Uh, but um, um, in, we're gonna be do using Zoom for a while. And um, one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to write to me, don't tell me right now, but write to me, 
and tell me what you what you think about uh, Zoom, how I'm using it, can we do a better job? Um, just tell me how it is because among other things, the, um, the club is paying for the subscription that I'm using. So this is our tool and I want to, I want to have a, a feel for uh, what you think of this particular tool for getting together. Uh, as you've as I've demonstrated before, one of the things that I can do is I can actually share my screen so you can see what I'm doing on my computers. And I've actually used that for someone who had uh, what they thought was a virus infection on their computer. Uh, we used Zoom, they shared their screen so I could see what it was that they were seeing, and it turned out it was not a virus infection. What they had done is they had accidentally uh, deleted all of the documents on their, uh, on their computer. So it was just as bad, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a virus. So it's a useful tool, but I do want to get some feedback on, on what people think of it. We have two more minutes before we're gonna start. Uh, any other questions? No questions? I like it so much better because uh, we don't have to leave our house. I can see you, I can see what you're working on. And it's just, I just think it's so much better. <laughs> I get more out of the meeting on this than I did in coming into the classroom. Uh, one comment that somebody made, which had took me by surprise, was that they could see what I'm doing uh, easier because yes. it's right there on their computer screen, which, yes. which is not yes. something I actually thought about. I, I could care less if we ever go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of like the interaction because um, at, at meetings in the past, see, I've been doing most of the talking, but at meetings in the past, people have showed me uh, photographs that they've taken of things or they've shown me their laptops and how they've configured it. And I miss that kind of uh, interaction. Yeah. Um, I'm not a particularly sociable people. I, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm not really one of these people who delights in being in a crowded room, but uh, I'm not a person who wants to be stuck in my home for the next eight months either. So uh, I would like to, I would like to see some people. I've, um, in the past several months, I've been doing the uh, church services for our church. We, we videotape, we video them, and then I put the movies together and I publish it for the church. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of sad sometimes seeing the minister standing in this empty sanctuary talking to nobody. And for the minister, it's really hard too because the minister, if he's, if he's got an actual living crowd out in front of him, he can tell, am I putting them to sleep? Are they paying attention? Are they looking down at their phone? And do they just want to uh, flee? And when he does a video, there's nothing there. He's just him and a camera. So it's, yeah. it's hard on the minister, too. Uh, but putting two together sometimes, I feel really sorry for the minister. Um, anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's 7 o'clock. Pardon? Can I ask a quick question? Uh, may I ask who's calling, who's talking? It's Sabrina. Hello, Sabrina. Hi. Can you... Is there a way of how to um, uh, print out text messages? Is there a way to print text messages? messages? Right. You so mean a long dialogue? Is there a way you can print them out? Yes. Just do a copy paste, copy them, uh, paste them into uh, something like Word or a text editor and print them. It really I is. I guess I, I'd have to look at my phone again. I thought the option was um, trash, like you can individually Oh, tap. you're talking about on the phone. Yeah, on iMessage. Yeah, but iMessage also shows up on your, on your computer as long as it's logged into, uh, it, as long as it's logged into uh, your Apple ID. So they show up there too. I've had the, pro the problem where they don't always show up. Some will and some don't, and it does. It's not a, a hundred percent that it's in the computer. Yeah, that's and, and the reason for that. Uh, that was something we talked about well, a couple months ago. If if uh, if I 
if I text you to your phone number, that's a different thread than if I text you to your Apple ID. So that's why sometimes the, that you'll have messages that don't show up because on your, on your computer, it doesn't really ever get the ones that go to your phone number, for example. So yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Um, from the phone, I, I ha I'd have to think about that. I don't happen to have an answer. Um, All three of mine go to both. They, they go to the phone, they go to my computer and my iPad. Uh, yes, my but, but if I sent you a text specifically to your phone number, say I didn't use your name, but I just oh, mentioned your phone oh. number, that'll only go to your phone. So it's, it's a little complicated. Um, it's, it's after seven now, so uh, a couple things I wanted to note. I'm recording this, uh, am I recording this meeting? Yes, I'm recording this meeting for Kathleen because she took my mother to the hospital, uh, to the ER, and uh, she wanted to know what, what else we were doing. And um, I want to make sure that everyone realizes that I'm recording it. I'm not gonna do anything with it, not gonna post it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly private because Kathleen will see it, but I'm not gonna do anything with it. Uh, the second thing I wanted to remind people of is that down at the bottom it says participants and if you click that it'll give you the list of the participants and right next to it it says chat and if you open up the chat window at the very top there is a url to a google form and i'd appreciate everyone going to that form and basically saying that you attended the meeting and it also has little uh, spots for the last two meetings uh, because uh, i don't want to take attendance and this way it'll tell us uh, who attended and before we do anything else, I wanted to ask Sabrina, did you want to say anything as, uh, as uh, El Presidente? La Presidenta? La Presidenta. Well, first I want to welcome everybody um, that's joining us. It looks like there's 12 of us on. And a quick reminder, um, this same place where Lawrence uh, posted the URL for the sign-in, I wrote in the address um, for a couple of people, the dues are coming due this month, and um, the dues were $24, and um, they can be made out to uh, Smug or Straight Mac user group, either way, and, um, oh, and I have to thank Kathleen tremendously. She does an absolutely wonderful job on um, doing our minutes, and if you haven't been to the website, please, please go. That it's just amazing what Lawrence and Kathleen have done by either putting the minutes on. There's phenomenal links down there as well for, um, I like the one that you did. It's, is it called for the geeks or? Oh, yes. Something like it's totally cool. And there was a, a cool link in there, um, how to make sure that your television or your smart television wasn't, um, I don't want to say watching you, uh, you know, so that it's not, yeah, I guess watching or recording or, or listening to everything that you're doing so that um, for your privacy. And I thought that was an excellent link along with other ones that I think are very beneficial that we don't normally talk about on our, our meetings. But um, yeah, very well done. And again, thanks a million to Kathleen for how well she, I don't know how she does it so well. It's like we're, you can read our meeting instead of watching our meeting. It's so well done. So anyway. That's everything from me. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, I just want to say I had to click on chat after I clicked on uh, reactions because just clicking on chat didn't get me the sign-in screen. Uh, okay. I clicked on reactions and didn't do anything more with it and then immediately clicked on chat and got the sign-in box to add my name. So I'm seeing Barb and Nori Johnson and my name and nobody else so far. Um, are, are we talking about the spreadsheet that I had, the, the form for attendance or what, or something else? The, the Zoom group chat? Oh yes, but the, what I was referring to is right at the top of that, it's a scrolling box. Right at the top there is a form that uh, you can fill out and to say that you attended the meeting. I didn't want you not to type. Seeing, not seeing it. It's a link to the form. 
Oh yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a link to the form. PPD and all that stuff. Yeah, I'll post that again right this second, so it'll be now right at the bottom. Oh no, it says privately. Why? Uh, that's because I I did this wrong. Let's send this to everyone. Um, the our treasurer hasn't logged in, but I did want to tell everybody that we paid two more bills, and I don't remember how much they were. The uh, website registration came due, and I don't even remember how much it was, but uh, we paid that, so a uh, certain amount of money disappeared out of the treasury. But I'm not the treasurer, so I don't keep track of that. Uh, but I did want you to be aware that uh, we so far this year we paid for the Zoom, and uh, we paid for the domain name, and we paid for the um, website rental uh, to, to host it. Um, so um, I just want people to know that we did that because she's, um, she's getting it right now. Oh, I'm using her computer and it's in the computer that I'm using for Zoom right now. So <laughs> I can't get you that right now. Uh, okay. <laughs> Do we have any other business that uh, we need to discuss or any questions people have about club business? This yes? Is Dar uh, this is Darcy Palm. I'm not on video. Um, I'm an old smug member from before it disbanded. And I just started uh, Zooming in last month. I've not paid dues and I'm not familiar with the website. Um, I would like to continue, but uh, where do I send my twenty-four dollars to? <laughs> oh, the, the, in the chat window, uh, Sabrina pasted that earlier. Um, it is, uh, it's. Uh, I, did, I did fill out the form, so my email address is there. Okay, this is the um, mailing address for the for the treasurer. And just write a check, and it can be to Straight Macintosh User Group, or it can be to Smug. And she says either one works. So uh, Lawrence and Sabrina, I uh, paid my check the very first time you guys started the meetings, uh, and I don't remember when we started them. But so my, do I understand that she will let me know when my dues are ready? Uh, the the answer is yes. We need to remind people to uh, repay their dues. I had promised uh, Anise that I would put a little piece of code that would flag people whose dues were due, and I haven't done that yet because I haven't been feeling good the last uh, couple weeks. So as soon as I am together enough to work on that, I'll do that. Um, but we have a database that's maintained in Google, and I need to write a little piece of code that'll flag uh, the last time the dues were paid, and if it's overdue, change color or something. I don't, haven't decided what I'm going to do yet, um, but uh, I've ordered, I've owed her that, and I haven't done it yet. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. <laughs> if you did join um, last, so it would have been in July, is when we started dues. So if you did join last year in July, your dues would be coming due. Oh, okay. I, I, I See, don't. I thought we didn't join until like in, in the fall, but I guess I'm wrong. I thought it was earlier than that. I thought it was like March or April, but again, the mm -hmm. spreadsheet knows that I don't, I don't remember. Um, there are things I need to remember. That isn't one of them. So I, I am uh, leaving that up to the treasurer. Um, any other questions before I begin the presentation? The treasurer is here. Hello, treasurer. Hello, Hi, everybody. Do you, do you, off the top of your head, you don't have to look it up, do you remember how much the bill was for Word for the WordPress site? I think I gave the num I gave the numbers through last me on the last month's meeting. Now I don't have it in front of me. Of where we are exactly, but uh, I think it was a little something around hundred dollars for the last one. I think the last one was like ninety something for WordPress and eighteen or twenty for the domain. 
something right, like that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. We all, um, if you have questions, we can we can tell you what it is. But I just want you to know that we we have not used the money to we have not embezzled it and gone on a on a drinking spree in Tijuana. Um, it's all here. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. What do you do? You uh, when we do our Bible study, we unmute and op open our hand to talk. So how do you do it with your group again? I'm an old member and just started back? Um, the answer is, when I share my screen, there is a way to have somebody here help me do this, but my, my spouse is not here right now. But um, when I share my screen, I can't see the interface that tells me that people are waving their hands and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when I'm sharing my screen, I'm just going to leave everyone unmuted. And if you have a question, just try not to disrupt my train of thought. If you have a question, just ask the question. It's the easiest way because uh, uh, if somebody else is, can watch the interface, they can they can mute and unmute people and admit them and so on and so forth. But if I'm doing it all by myself, once I start sharing my screen, I don't see any of the Zoom interface. It just all goes okay, away. Okay, thank you. So um, I can't really do that. Um, uh, any other questions? Because I'm going to start with a little bit of show and tell. And um, I'm going to show you some cameras first, and then I'm going to show you what you can do with the cameras. But before we get even to the, into that, uh, the original Macintosh screen, and this is actually important, uh, the original Macintosh screen was 512 pixels across by 342 pixels down. And it was black and white only. And that doesn't seem terribly important when you when that, when uh, when your iPhone today is uh, four thousand pixels across and three thousand pixels down. That original Macintosh screen seems tiny, but the that original Macintosh screen had one unique characteristic that changed forever computer video, and that is the pixels were square. That seems possibly irrelevant, but the original computer screens that everybody else were using, they were using cathode ray tubes, which were TV tubes, and the pixels were, were uh, rectangles. And if you take a rectangle that's 640 pixels across and 300 uh, down, and you rotate it into that same space, you end up with pictures that are squashed or stretched. And so the first computer pictures that people took, say they took a horizontal uh, photo, that worked fine. But if they took a vertical photo, when they put it on a computer screen, everybody looked like they were on planet Jupiter and squished down to pancake size. With the Mac screen, you could rotate the picture and it kept the same shape. That seems trivial today, but the Macintosh in front of you has square pixels today, hasn't changed. Your, your iPhone has square pixels. Cameras that used to have the rectangle pixels were immediately done away with because the Macintosh, when you're editing the software and you flip it horizontally and flip it vertically, wouldn't squish people, wouldn't stretch people. So that original Macintosh has changed computer technology forever, even though it was black and white, and even though it really didn't have you know, the video that we know today. The first Mac camera, the first Apple camera, was the Apple Quick Take 100, and they also came up with a one after that, the Quick Take 150. This was back in 1994 and 1995. These were actually Kodak cameras that Apple rebranded. And if you think about it, Kodak was then making the most popular digital camera in the world for Apple. And that act of making those digital cameras for Apple ended up eventually killing Kodak. Kodak put itself out of business by making digital cameras for Apple. So um, that was 640 by 480 pixels. So just tiny if by comparison to what your uh, Apple camera can do. And the first camera that Apple had that could work on a computer 
was the EyeSight camera of 2003, which again was 640 by 480. Now, this right here is the most popular camera in the world, not necessarily this model, but the iPhone. More pictures are taken with an iPhone every day than were taken with all cameras in the world from the time they were invented back in the 1830s until the end of the 20th century. Every day we take more pictures than all of the 20th century and the 19th century combined. Now, admittedly, most of, these compute, most of these photographs are stupid. They're pictures of your keyboard or your dinner or that strange crack in the bathroom that you want the people at Home Depot to know about. Uh, it, most of them are informational pictures. We, in terms of taking fine art pictures, we don't take as many. We now use this for documenting things. You go into, you go into QFC and they have a sale on some cereal and you take a picture and you mail it home and say, would you like some of this because it's on sale? So we use it uh, for a lot, just information rather than, than artistic photography. But this is the most popular camera and the most heavily used camera ever made. And it also just, you know, coincidentally, you can make phone calls on it. But I don't know about you, I don't do that very often, but I do use it for taking pictures. This is a different kind of camera. This looks like a traditional camera. You know, this one has a, has a zoom lens, so it goes in and out. But one of the things that this has that the iPhone doesn't have is it has a viewfinder. If you look here on the back, there's a place that I can look through here to see what it is I'm taking a picture of. A lot of people don't like a viewfinder because you have to hold it up to your face and look through it. But one huge advantage it has is stability. When you take a photograph with a, with a, with a camera, with, with, a, with a phone, you hold it out in front of you. And it, holding it away from your body it instantly makes it less steady. You cannot take a, a steady picture with a, with a, with a phone as well as you can with a traditional viewfinder camera. So any, any phone, including you know, independent cameras, that you have to look at the back in order to see the photograph, then you cannot take as clear a picture as you can with a traditional camera. The other problem you have with something like this, where you're looking at the back of the uh, device in order to see a picture, let's bring up this. If you're looking at the back of it, One thing you'll notice when you go out in the sun is that you can't see this. In this darkened room, you can actually see the screen fairly well. Actually, you're looking at a picture of yourself, by the way. But uh, if you go out in the sun, it's very difficult to see through this, whereas with a viewfinder camera, it's very easy to see the subject. And if you're wearing polarized sunglasses on a sunny day, it's almost impossible to see what's on your um, iPhone when you take pictures. When you take a picture, on a sunny day, you're basically taking it on faith because you have no idea what your, what your phone can see. So this is, this is a much more traditional camera. I bought this one because it's tiny. If you look at it in terms of the size, of, it's bulkier than the iPhone, but it's even smaller than the iPhone. And it fits in my raincoat and I can take photographs with it. Uh, I just put it in my raincoat and I'm, I ride my bike take photographs with it. I have another camera. This camera incidentally cost like $500, something like that, five, $600. Um, it's actually a very, very good camera, but it's just very small. This is the one that I use when I want to take really good photographs. The iPhone takes 12 megapixel pictures. And 12 megapixels just means there are 12 million dots. This one takes 20 megapixel pictures. So it can take a higher quality picture than the iPhone. This one takes 42 megapixel pictures. That means that I can take a photograph with this, cut out the upper left quarter of the photograph of, that this takes, and it's a higher quality than the entire photograph of the iPhone. So this is a very nice camera. The lens on it right now, I think, is a 70 to 300 millimeter, 
which means that I can zoom in on things far away and I can take things up close. This also costs a fortune. Which model was that? Uh, that is um, Sony Alpha A7. It's what's called a mirrorless camera. Traditional single lens reflex cameras, when you press the button, there's a mirror inside that flips up out of the way so the shutter can take the photograph. And when it flips up out of the way, it adds jiggle. One of the nice things about the mirrorless cameras is there's no mirror flipping up out of the way. So they're smaller, they're more compact, they weigh less than a traditional um, single lens re uh, 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 DSLR. And um, there's less jiggle. Uh, this particular one, the the image, the imager, the 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 chip that the it, that's storing the picture, is one inch uh, in uh, dimensions. It's the size of a thirty-five millimeter piece of film. The one on the um, iPhone is like one sixteenth of an inch. So the the uh, sensor is much larger, and because it's much larger. Uh, it can shoot much faster and it can shoot in dim light and so on and so forth, which is why it costs a fortune. The last one I want to show you is this one. And this camera, which is um, like $800, $900, this one here looks intimidating, but it even looks more intimidating if you extend the telephoto. The um, iPhone, and this is not a this is a fixed lens camera. They, it doesn't come off. So um, it, unlike my Sony, the Sony, I can take the lens off and replace it with another one. This one I can't. But my iPhone 11 has a 2x zoom. That means that whatever I'm taking a picture of normally, I can press a button and I, I'm twice as close. This one has a one, the one I just showed you, that big mother, has a hundred x zoom and so it's it's got a really good zoom what it doesn't have is has very poor image stabilization and the sensor is small so there's a trade-off uh, it doesn't cost a staggering amount of money a zoom lens of that quality for my for my sony alpha would be around 12 grand and this entire camera is a thousand bucks so you get what you pay for it does allow me to zoom in places closer but the quality is not as good as, um, as um, uh, a really good lens. I'm now going to share my screen because I want to show some example photographs. Uh, so I'm going to turn on the screen and, and if you happen to know something strange, tell me because I can't see what Zoom is doing when I share my screen. Let's move you out of the way. Um, this is a photograph I took earlier today on my way to uh, Port Angeles. This, if you've driven into Port Angeles, you've seen this uh, business before. And every time I see it, it cracks me up because to my way of thinking, this is saying that this store is pre-owned. I don't know exactly what it's supposed to be telling me, but grammatically it's telling me this is a used store. And I just think it's funny. So I stopped by today and take a, took a photograph of it. But one of the other things I want to show you, I'm opening this up in preview, and you all have preview on your computer. What you probably didn't know is preview has some photography tools. You can go through, you can annotate things, you can crop things, you can flip things. So what I want to do is I want you to crop out the part of this that I think is interesting. And so I just go out here and I drag it over using the crop tool, it's under tools, and I say crop, and that's my photograph. And that seems kind of small, but one of the things that you don't know is it's not that actual size. If you say actual size, you'll see it's really a fairly big picture. And now I have my photograph of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, pre-owned superstore, which is to my way of thinking, I just think that's quite funny. And another picture that I took today was this one. This is a sign, I don't know why 
somebody made this, but this sign is in a vacant lot in, uh, in um, Port Angeles. And I took a picture of it. The two pictures that I'm just showing you of, of things, these are the kinds of photographs that people most often take with, um, with their iPhones. And the big advantage of the iPhone is it's with you. The best camera you can ever have is the one that's with you. And because this is a phone and I carry it with me all the time, it was with me. So today I took those two pictures. Neither one of those are great works of art, but they're the kind of pictures that we take every day simply because we have a camera in our pocket. So we take pictures of price tags. We take pictures of labels of ingredients. We take pictures of the stickers on the sides of cars so we could go tell our spouses that this new car that they went to buy, it comes with you know, four-way address adjustable power seats and things like that. Um, I'm going to give you some other pictures to examples of, of more artistic pictures. This is a picture of a hummingbird that I took. Um, I was eating breakfast and a hummingbird came by um, and looked at the fuchsia plant outside. And if I use, uh, if I use preview to, to say view actual size, you can see there's a fair amount of detail there. And this what that was taken with that uh, that super zoom camera that I was telling you I had. Um, so nice picture of a hummingbird. What I won't show you is all the pictures of the hummingbird that didn't actually take uh, place. I have several out of focus pictures of the fuchsia plant that I was trying to take the hummingbird, but the hummingbird decided to fly away. So um, I, I missed it. This is a picture of Winslow Crater in Arizona. Winslow Crater is the largest meteor uh, crater on the planet that's still fully formed. And it's near Winslow, Arizona, which is why it's called Winslow Crater. This was taken with the panorama option on my iPhone. The, the, previous one, this was taken with my super zoom camera, and this was taken with the iPhone. The iPhone, if I'm taking pictures of this, it can't show much of the crater, it would just be in sections, but the iPhone has something called a panorama mode. If you have something in camera panorama mode, you move your camera very slowly and you can take pictures of wide objects. So this was taken with my iPhone, and uh, this was taken with my Sony, if I did the launch, my Sony camera, which is much more expensive. And you'll notice they're similar, but they're not the same. The panorama on my iPhone, it's distorted. It wraps around my, I'm on a balcony and it looks like the balconies on both sides of me. Whereas the one with my Sony looks nice and proportional. There's also a difference in terms of what it happened. This panorama that I shot with my iPhone, that's one picture that was taken with my iPhone. This one that I shot with my Sony, that's actually eight or 10 photographs that I stitched together because it doesn't really have a panorama mode. So I just stitched them together from multiple photographs. And this is what that, without a, this is the kind, this is one photograph with my Sony camera. This is the kind of photograph that I was taking to stitch them all together. And just to show you the quality of the Sony camera, this is one photograph zooming in on the base, the, the uh, base of the crater. And if I tell it to go to actual size, it's not really probably terribly apparent to you but there's an annotate tool I'm going to show you. Um, I don't want it to be, uh, maybe I won't show it to you with that annotate tool. Maybe I'll show it to you with an arrow tool. Annotate arrow. Okay, right here, there is a small man next to a flag. That is a six foot photograph of six foot placard of an astronaut and the American flag. And they did that to give you a sense of scale. Over here, 
this is a steam engine left over from when they were doing mining in the bottom of this crater. Um, in the late 1890s, 1900s, I have no idea what they thought they were gonna find in the bottom of the crater, uh, because it's a meteor crater. It's not like they could pan for gold or something like that, but they were mining there, and this is leftover mining equipment in the bottom of the crater. But, um, And the panorama mode that you have on your iPhone, another thing you can do is it doesn't have to go across. Most people, when they take panoramas, they do panoramas. But this is a um, antique uh, gas station pump at a uh, bar in uh, University Village in Seattle. Um, I don't drink, but it's a restaurant too, so I went in there and they have this um, antique uh, gas pump. And if you just take a photograph of it, you can't get the whole uh, gas pump. So I used the iPhone's panorama mode to do a panorama from top to bottom and to get the gas pump. So uh, you can do, you can use cameras in different ways. I want to now show you some, uh, yeah, I want to do that. This. I want to show you some photographs. I went out to the, um, there's a restoration area, Dungeness restoration area at the end of uh, Squim Dungeness Highway where uh, Three Crabs restaurants uh, used to be. And I never saw a Three Crabs restaurant. It burned down before I ever moved here. But I went out there and I took pictures of the Dungeness, new Dungeness light. This is using my iPhone 11 in regular mode, you just fire it up, and this is just using the uh, one of the three lenses. This is the default lens. And the uh, lighthouse is in here someplace. You, you really can't see it in this uh, photograph, but take, trust my word, it's there. And that's in, in regular mode. This is with the wide angle look mode. And in the wide angle mode, if you compare the two, uh, you'll see that in the wide angle mode, I get this log in front, and you really can't tell where the lighthouse is at all. It's completely gone. And there are some people here, and there are more people off to the right. And in the default mode, you only see one group of people, and you really don't see the log at all. So that's a difference between the, uh, the uh, um, regular mode and the wide angle mode. But then it also has a telephoto mode. So we're going to leave the regular mode. Actually, I'm going to launch all three at once. The easiest way to do it. This is the regular mode. This is the wide angle mode. And this is with the 2x telephoto. With the 2x telephoto, you can begin to see the lighthouse out here. And again, because it's a telephoto, it's twice as, you're getting one fourth as much of a view, but it's twice as large. The mathematics sometimes are a little bit weird, but uh, it, you actually, when, you, when you're doing a telephoto, it's actually one fourth as of the area of this previous photograph. The photographs themselves are the same size in pixels. This is the same number of pixels as this one, and this is the same number of pixels as this one. But the three lenses are concentrating on different aspects of the same photo. All those were taken with an iPhone. Now I want to show you what my little pocket camera can do. My little pocket camera, when you first bring it up, that's the little black one that I told you had a viewfinder. Um, when I first take a shot, that's what it looks like. But if I crank it all the way out to a 5X telephoto, you can see the lighthouse. So this was taken from the same spot, one with the telephoto and one without, with my little viewfinder. And you'll notice the viewfinder that with the telephoto, I get a much better view of the lighthouse from that spot. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like with my uh, Nikon with the super zoom. If you if you crank it all the way out, it acts more like a, a wide angle lens. So this is shot with my Nikon 
in a wide angle. This is zoomed in a little bit. This is zoomed in more. And this is zoomed in almost as far as I can get. So dramatically different views using that super zoom camera. But if you look at the quality, this one doesn't look too bad. This one doesn't look too bad. This one, I can tell this is a little fuzzy. And if I say view actual size, you'll see that it's, it's just fuzzier. And it's got noise. Noise are these little spreckles that appear through the photograph. And let's undo that. And the super zoom one, if you zoom in that way, it looks not very good at all. Looks more like an impressionist photo than, uh, than a photograph. Now I'm going to try to open all at once so I can flip through them and you can get a uh, feel for what they look for. This is the iPhone uh, 11 using just the standard lens with the wide angle lens with the telephoto lens. This is my little pocket Canon camera with the uh, normal lens and this is with the telephoto lens. This is my super zoom camera at the wide angle setting zoomed in a little zoomed in a lot zoomed in a lot now of these pictures which one would you say is the best photo this is not a new rhetorical question you get to actually say which one do you like the best No comments? Doesn't it depend on what you want? It does depend on what you want, but they're actually kind of standards for photographs. And I would say that the two best ones are the iPhone in normal mode and my PowerShot in normal mode. The PowerShot is technically the best photo because among other things, the colors are more saturated. It's a larger photo. It's 20 megapixels. Uh, it's, it's a, this is a good photo. The uh, iPhone photo is also good. The colors are very good. Uh, it's a good photo in terms of just artistic quality. Nice, brilliant blue. When you, when you zoom in with the uh, iPhone, I'm losing that blue patch up at the top and it's just not as dynamic a photo. And all of the super zoom photos, because I don't see the uh, blue sky above, it kind of misses out on, well, actually you do with the very first one. This one's not too bad, but it's not as, it's not as good a photograph as the, as the one with my iPhone and the one with my uh, pocket camera. Um, those I would say are the, these two are the best photos in terms of photography. If I was talking about specifically lighthouses and the structure of lighthouses, this one that it has the big super zoom, even though it's fuzzy, tells you a lot more about lighthouses. You can see the Fresnel lens up at the top. You can see the light, well, I can see it. I don't know if you can see it. You can see the lightning arrest at the very top. You can see the railing to make sure the lighthouse keeper doesn't fall off and the chimneys. Uh, the, this is the technical name of this lighthouse. It's the new Dungeness Lighthouse. It's the only Dungeness Lighthouse. There never was an old Dungeness Lighthouse. It's called New Dungeness because Dungeness is actually in Scotland. So this is New Dungeness. And it's got the um, chimneys because at the time that they built this, that was the power source. Uh, if you wanted to stay warm in the wintertime, you needed to have a fireplace. So if you're talking about looking at the architecture of lighthouses, this is a good photograph. But in terms of artistically, these other ones with the nice saturated color and the puffy clouds uh, are more artistic. And these were done with the two least expensive cameras, the, uh, the um, iPhone and my little um, uh, tiny little um, uh, Nikon. I was asked before the meeting started about how do you take a good stable picture with a camera, with, a, with an iPhone? 
And the answer to that is it depends a lot about the uh, camera. And to do that, I'm going to turn off sharing so I can give you kind of a show and tell type thing. So I'll turn it back so you can see me. If you take a picture with the phone, with your camera, with your, with your iPhone, in order to see what you're doing, ah, and I have another phone call, sorry. Hello? Hello? That was about my mother. Um, when you're taking a picture with, a, with your phone, you have to hold it out like this. And holding it out away from your body makes it impossible to hold it steady. It's just not possible. So the question is, how do you get a stable picture? And uh, the easy way is to use a camera that's got a viewfinder. The viewfinder's in the back and you look through it. And in order to take the picture, you hold it up to your eye and it's close to your body. You hold it up to your, uh, your, your eye, and then you put your elbows up against your body so you make a tripod. One is where it's held up against your eye, and the other two points of the tripod is where it's held against your body. Taking a photograph with this camera will always be better than with an iPhone simply because there's no vibration. The leading cause of, of, of a bad photograph is vibration. Uh, the second leading cause is not having enough light. But more, more bad photographs are taken because of vibration than uh, anything else. So yeah, but you can still use a tripod, though. Well, I'm getting to that. So, uh. <laughs> um, but if you if you just take a snap photograph, this can take a better snap photograph because your body is the tripod, and you really don't have that advantage with a. Um, uh, and I didn't mean to do that. Um, you really can't have that advantage with an iPhone because uh, you take it out and you probably don't have a tripod with you. However, this is a tripod. It's a little collapsible tripod. It's not terribly big and it's designed so you can move the legs in any way you want. But the other thing about it that makes it interesting is that at the top of the tripod, and it's got this little strange little device and you take your phone and you stick it in here and then you clamp it in place. And in the process, and I'm not clamping in properly, but in the process, now you have a phone on a tripod. And not only do you have a phone on a tripod, but it also rotates. So you can take horizontal and vertical and you don't have to use this dinky little tripod. You can use a, a regular full-size tripod. It, um, uh, that's, this little gizmo is made by an um, uh, Italian company uh, that makes tripods. And it's called uh, uh, MeFoto, M-E-F-O-T-O. And it's not that expensive. Um, but I like this particular one because it's so adjustable got knobs on both sides so you can adjust it any old way you want. And it rotates, which is important when you have an iPhone because you might be think you want to shoot one way and then something happens you decide you want to switch the other way. It makes it easy to do. But it also, because it is adjustable, it'll actually fit on a phone with a case. A lot of the, a lot of the clamps that you see to uh, mount a uh, iPhone on a tripod, the clamps are so tight that you realize that they were designed for a phone without a case. And if you're out in, outside and there are ducks running around loose, you don't want to take your, your phone out of the case in order to attach to a tripod. Because at that point, you're probably going to drop it on the ground just taking it out of the case. So you want to get, a, you want to get uh, one of these gizmos that it will support both the phone and the phone in the case. And this one, it's the best one I've seen in terms of being um, adjustable for that. But even if you're not 
even if you don't want to use it as a tripod, the other thing that it has advantages it has is that if you if you clamp um, the phone onto this gizmo, and assuming I've got it attached in there, one thing you have to notice is that it acts like a pendulum. It makes your iPhone more stable. Even if you do, you're not resting it on the ground or on the top of your car or something, just having this dangle down, create it makes the iPhone more stable. So you don't even have to put it on top of a car or something. Just having the iPhone on top of this makes it more stable. And that, I, I want to mention that because it's something that uh, a lot of people don't know. I have, I have a, um, I usually use this on top of uh, what's called a monopod. I have a monopod that's a walking stick. It's just like you use a walking stick for walking around in the wilderness. But the top screws off and I can screw this on top of it. And then I can take a nice steady picture with my iPhone uh, using this bracket. And if I want to move, I can just lift it off the ground and still use it because the weight of the monopod plus the bracket makes my iPhone more stable because it's not just dependent upon my arms at that point. It's actually adding a kind of a, a counterweight to the camera to make it more stable. The other thing that to do is if you, if you have trouble with something that's moving a lot, you may not have ever played around with it enough to know, but if you hold down on the shutter on your camera, you just keep on, hold, if you hold it down, I don't know if you can hear this, but we'll see. You just hold it down, and why are you not doing what I want you to do? Yeah. It's not acting with the way I want it. Hmm. I might have turned it off, but there is a, it, it, um, it'll just take a whole bunch of photographs real quick. Now, if you're taking a picture of somebody moving and you slowly are moving the camera and you turn on that auto shutter, it'll take a picture about, oh, one every eighth of a second, just a whole bunch of photographs real quick. And if you're taking a picture of a moving child or a duck or whatever it is that you're taking a picture of, you might end up with eight blurry photos, but you might end up with two that are very good. So that's another trick to take, uh, take non-blurry photos, is just uh, set it into, uh, take a burst mode is what it's called, that's what it's called. I, it took me a while, but I remember what it's called. Um, and why are you not working in burst mode? It's supposed to just start firing away. Oh well. I was doing something else with it, so it's probably confused. Yeah, is there any kind of adjustment on the phone that can compensate for movement? The answer is yes and no. This particular camera uh, this particular phone, the iPhone 11 Pro Max, which is a really stupid name, the, um, the lenses actually have a um, um, gimbal. Pardon me? A gimbal? It's not a gimbal because it's done electronically, but um, it's got a, a motion sensor in it that counteracts the motion that, of your body but it only does it to a certain extent, and that's automatic. And it's not on the less expensive. I, I don't think it's on the iPhone SE, for example. I think it's only on the higher end ones. And so I can't say that that's going to be useful to a lot of people because, um, why aren't you doing what I want? Um, it doesn't provide a great deal of compensation, but for very small, uh, changes in, in uh, orientation, it'll stabilize. The, I, that's what I was looking for, image stabilization. It has image stabilization. So the, the, uh, the uh, camera lenses in the iPhone Pro Max and the prior to that, the iPhone 10 and a few others, have image stabilization where the lens itself actually quivers a little bit in order to counteract your motion. Uh, but it, there are limits on terms of what you, uh, how much compensation you can do. The other thing to do to help reduce vibration is, has nothing to do with vibration at all. It has to do with light. This gizmo right here is a light. It's USB powered, so you plug it into a, a 
uh, it's got a little port and you plug it into a, a uh, USB cable to recharge it. But when you turn it on, it's a bright light. So if you just look at me, if I turn, turn this on me, you can see it's a quite bright light. They have, this is the original one, which was called uh, Luma, LumQ, uh, the original one, but they have a new one out that's, that looks more like a, it's a large, it's about the size of the iPhone, but it's a rectangular shape so that you can use it for video conferencing with light, lighting yourself up. But this is designed so that you can attach it to an iPhone or you can attach it to a tripod. I normally attach it to this tripod and when I'm taking a photograph of something, I have this illuminate my subject and then I take a picture of it. Because the more light you have, the faster your camera, your, your camera, be it a regular camera, your iPhone will take a photo. And if it takes the photo very rapidly, it reduces the chance of vibration. So the worst possible uh, way to take a photograph is to go into a room that's lit by a birthday candle and nothing more at night holding your camera out in front of you like this. Because at that point, your camera's vibrating, there's no light to be had, and if it's a birthday cake, it means nobody's standing still. They're all moving. And at that point, you're guaranteed to take um, um, a blurry photo. So reduce the number of things that can blur. Make sure that your subject isn't moving. Make sure you have a lot of light, and try to take um, as steady a picture as possible, either by putting it on a tripod or bracing it with your body. Even the iPhone, unless you're really farsighted like I am, if you brace it up against your body, have your, your uh, elbows touching your chest and hold it like this, it's more stable than holding it like this. Uh, it's, just, it's just physics. It's much easier to take a steady photograph if your body is, is stabilizing it. So just use yourself as a tripod. Uh, when you see somebody waving their phone out in front of them with one hand taking photographs and expecting it to look great, there's a good chance they won't even get a photograph of what they're um, shooting. They're gonna take a photograph of something else instead. Uh, they just, there's just too much um, interactivity there and you're probably gonna have the wrong things. wanted to show you one more picture so I'm going going back to sharing my screen of um, um, one thing that might help uh, um, Marcia I think it was it was having that question about about uh, shaking like that um, um, you might try one of those gimbaled uh, selfie sticks oh yes um, that might help and the selfie sticks they look sort of like this pushed together, there's a, some batteries inside of it and a bunch of uh, electronics. And as you move your uh, wrist, it holds the iPhone stable. That when you actually see one for the first time in action, it's kind of creepy. And if, <laughs> <It is. laughs> if and when uh, the Apple stores open up, uh, or if you want to go over to Seattle, they might be open already, I don't know. The uh, Apple Store at University uh, Village and the Apple Store at Alderwood Mall, I don't know about the one at Tacoma, they do have those, um, those uh, um, st steady cam is a commercial name for a particular type, but basically it holds your camera steady when you're walking. They were originally developed for video. Um, I don't know how many of you are Star Wars fans, but the uh, original Star Wars movie had uh, them running these uh, things that looked like motorcycles that flew through a forest. How those were actually filmed was a man with a steady cam was walking through the forest, just walking through the forest with a camera running at high speed. And then when they play it back at normal speed in the theaters, it looked like these people were zooming through a forest. And it looks very, very steady because the steady cam compensated for the motion of him as he, as he stepped down and was jerking around. It compensated for that. Um, well, it was one of the breakthrough um, pieces of, uh, of video was just that scene of him walking through the forest with his camera. And then you see what they happened when they put the rest of the video 
and they have these speeders going at 150 miles an hour through wet, a redwood forest. It was done basically with a camera and some batteries and some motors. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, my picture of the lighthouse uh, and show, I need to show my screen again. So share screen. This was my wide angle photo using my iPhone 11. And you can't really see the lighthouse out there. This was a wide angle photo of the lighthouse out there. You still can't see it. This was taken in the winter time. This was done in panorama mode on the, on the uh, iPhone. So this first one is, let's see, it is 4,032 pixels across. And the one in panorama mode is uh, 16,382 by 3,628 pixels across. So this photograph, that's 16,000 pixels across. If I blow it up to actual size, you begin to appreciate for the fact that this is a really large picture. And this was taken on an iPhone. And if I blow it up that size, you can actually see the lighthouse. But it's an immensely large photograph. But that was taken with an iPhone. When you're sending a photo to someone, what's the best size to send it in? That's a good question, uh, and I'm glad you asked that because it's something that a lot of people um, get wrong. You're, if, you, if you think about the size of an iPhone screen, it, it looks tiny, but this is, I don't remember the size of the screen, but it's something like a, it's uh, like uh, 2,000 pixels across and uh, 1,000 pixels down or something like that. It's a fairly large screen. So if, you were, if they were going to display it on their phone, you could send somebody a, a photograph that's uh, 1,000 by 2,000 pixels or 1,500 by 2,000 pixels, and it would fit on their phone. But it would be very large to transport. So you generally want to reduce it. On, our, on the um, Straight Mac user group website, I have a rule not to put up anything that's over a thousand pixels. So no matter what size the original is, I reduce it down to a thousand pixels or less. And that's because when people bring it up in a browser, they're not, they don't want to scroll back and forth in order to see this beautiful photograph. They want it to fit within the browser window. So for something that you're going to send via email, I would say anywhere from 600 pixels across to 2000 pixels across at the largest. And when I say across, that also applies down. So if you've got something that's only 600 across, but it's 3,000 pixels long, shrink it down to about 2,000 pixels. But I'll also show you another trick. Um, and to do that, I have to share, share my screen again. So I'm going to do that. Let's take um, this original photograph of this crater in Arizona. Uh, actually, I, it's, uh, I accidentally modified it. But anyway, this is, that image is uh, 4 million pixel, 4 million bytes, that photograph here. There is a utility that I have called uh, image optim, which means image optimization. If I just drag that image on here, ah, that's not dragging. If I drag it on here, it'll shrink it. And in this case, it didn't shrink it too much. You'll see the original was 4 million pixels and, and I did the wrong one. Let's try this again. Five, five. I shrink the wrong one. Shame on me. Yeah, 
capturing the wrong photograph. So let's try another one. Shrink this using image optimum. And the original was 4 million pixels, and the revised one is 3,623,000. I didn't do anything at all. They're the same dimensions, they're both 8,000 pixels across. but this one is uh, quite a bit smaller. Well, let's try this. Which one is the original? It's the smaller one. I'm going to take this now and I'm going to use preview to shrink it. By going up here, it says adjust size. And I said 1,000 pixels across. OK, let's type in 1,000 here to make it 1,000 pixels across. It shrinks it down. But if you look at it and say actual size, you'll see it's still pretty big. And by doing that, it is now uh, 236,000 bytes. Remember, it was originally 4 million. Now it's 236,000. I drag it onto this little utility called Image Optimum, and it shrinks it again. And now what was originally 4 million bytes is now 119,000 bytes. And that's the copy, and that's, the, that's part of the original. But as you can see, that's still pretty, pretty big. And if you're sending something to somebody in the mail, that's probably as big as they need to um, get. Uh, you don't need to send people a really huge image. Uh, and image optimum, by the way, is uh, free. It's spelled I-M-A-G-E-O-P-R-T-I-M. And it's, it's a free piece of software. Is so, it in the uh, App Store? I don't think this is in the App Store. Um, it's done by an independent developer who doesn't want to pay Apple to give away his program. Um, uh, if you give away a program on the App Store, you still have to pay Apple for the privilege of giving it away. And this guy didn't want to do that. So he's got a developer license, and it's a perfectly legitimate piece of program, but it's not on the App Store. Um, um, I used this when I was at uh, NOAA, by the way, to shrink images on the website so that when it loads into people's browsers, it would be quick because if they were sitting there waiting all day for an image to show up, they probably would get bored and go someplace else. So the answer to the general answer to the question is that if you're sending something to Costco to be printed on canvas, you probably want to send it in the original size. Don't shrink it. If you're sending it to somebody via email and you expect them to see it on a, an iPhone, then you probably don't need it to be any larger than a thousand pixels across or a thousand pixels down because the, it'll still look fine on the screen, but it won't clog up your email uh, with uh, overly large files. If I sent you a four million um, uh, 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 byte photograph, you probably would be unhappy if it because you're you're paying for the data to read it on your phone and you'd be unhappy. So shrink it to something appropriate. And you don't need to use Photoshop. You can just use preview. Click on the photo, use the tools to change the size, and in changing the size, you also reduce it. The converse, there's a there's a converse to this question though. I'm talking about making the picture smaller. From, from something big, but can you take a large, small photo and make it larger? That's a question. The you answer can, is- but it would be, look really bad. <laughs> yes. Uh, for those of you familiar with Kool-Aid, say you had enough Kool-Aid to make one quart. 
and 80 people show up and you decide, okay, you're going to use that same amount of Kool-Aid, but you're going to fill up 40 quarts worth of water. How's it going to taste? And that's basically what happens when you take a small photograph and try to make it large. You take a, what might be a perfectly good photograph, but I, by increasing the size, you're making it fall apart and it looks terrible. Chris, did you have a question? Yes. Um, um, billions and billions of pixels. Okay, can you translate that size for sending into um, a megabyte uh, number for me so I can like half a megabyte, no more than five megabytes, no more than 20 megabytes? Um, okay, that's, a, that's a actually a good question. The, the, generally speaking, if you're sending snapshots to people, which are casual photographs, you should probably try to keep them 100,000 bytes or less. And, and that's the reason, the reason for that is that if they're just snapshots, you know, hey, this is, I, I, I saw you down at the beach and that's, that's a casual photograph. It's not something that's gonna be in a museum. Uh, it's probably something that people won't even keep. So 100,000 bytes or less. If it's something that needs to be printed, you want the highest possible uh, resolution. So if it's gonna be, you're gonna send it off to Costco's photo service and have it printed on canvas, you want it to be as high as possible resolution. Is there a medium range in there? And the medium range in there is, um, um, I'll show you my screen on my computer. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second. This image in the background here that I have for my desktop, I took that photograph. And because I want it to look halfway decent, these photographs can't be shrunk down to a thousand uh, pixels. And the reason for that is my screen itself is 5,000 pixels across. So because I have a big screen, I want the photograph to be at least the same size as the screen. So these photographs that I use for my desktop are fairly large. They're in the like four or five megabyte range. But for something that you're sending casual snapshots, say 100,000 um, um, bytes is a good um, figure. If it's something that's you know, romantic or something, you might want to have it larger. I'll show you uh, some photographs that I took. Um, um, this is kind of a show and tell, so I'll, I'll show you some photographs I took recently. These were taken with my Nikon Super Zoom camera, and they're not great photographs, but I wanted to show you something about uh, photographs in general. This is a photograph I took. I thought it was funny. I shot using my super zoom camera. This woman is about two football fields away. But with that super zoom camera, I could zoom in on her. And I thought it was funny that she's walking three dogs, but she's actually carrying one of the dogs. Well, that's the original photograph. And I modified it. Um, some things you might notice, I changed the color of the background a little bit. So it's not quite as gray. It looks more uh, natural color. And I also cropped it. This has a whole bunch of rock here from the beach. Uh, this was taken near um, uh, John Wayne Marina, by the way. It was a low tide. Uh, but it's got a bunch of rock from the beach. And I cropped that so that it was this woman and her dogs. That, that occupies most of the picture. The other thing to notice, though, is that in the original photograph, there's more of the beach, there's more of it showing behind her than in front of her. But when I cropped it, it ends fairly close behind this last dog, but there's more room in front. As a general rule of font thumb, when you're taking a picture of somebody in motion, have extra space in front of them, because otherwise it looks like they're running into a wall. So give them some breathing space. And in this case, I made sure there was more room in front of the woman than behind her so that it looks like the photograph is breathing. This I would classify as in the middle of between a snapshot and a, a fine art. If I knew this woman and I was sending her a copy of the photograph, the original size of this photograph is about six megabytes. 
she probably doesn't want that. But I probably would reduce it to maybe one or two megabytes so that she gets a better picture because it's somebody that I know and she might, you know, be fond of her dogs or something. Another photograph I took at the same time was of this uh, woman taking a picture of her, uh, of her child. And it's not obvious right this second, but she's using an iPhone to take the photograph. And this is after I modified it a bit. And it's basically the same photograph, but I brightened it up a bit. So it was a little bit, it, it's, it's interesting. Cameras sometimes will underexpose things because it's too bright. And I just brightened it up so it looks more like what I actually saw. So the original was a little darker. I brightened it up a bit. But then I cropped it. And when I cropped it, Really, I don't need all that water and I don't need all that big beach because the subject of the photograph is this woman with her iPhone taking a picture of her child. And if you look at the size of the photographs, it, it kind of reflects this. The original photograph was, well, actually, I, this is somewhat reduced. The original was uh, two megabytes. The uh, First variation was 871,000 bytes. And the, oh no, that was the second one. Uh, the original was two megabytes. I reduced it down to one megabyte. And then the one that I cropped, it's 871,000 bytes. So just by turning it into literally a better picture by focusing just on the woman, I also made the photograph smaller. Did that answer your question or just confuse the issue? By cutting out the parts of a photograph that you don't want, you, you end up making it smaller. And again, you don't need Photoshop. I'm using Preview, which comes with every Mac. Um, Photoshop does a better job. You can do fancy things. But for most of us, um, you don't really need anything more than that. Any other questions? Yes. Quick one about sky. If you're taking a horizontal landscape aspect uh, orientation image, any rule about how much of it should or should not be sky? Uh, there's, um, there's an old adage, it's called the rule of thirds. Uh, having to do with, it's not just photographs, but it's all just artwork itself. The, um, uh, and it was developed during the 19th century by a bunch of uh, Frenchmen who decided to do a kind of uh, logical study of, um, uh, of uh, what makes art. And they came up with the idea of this rule of thirds. And da Vinci had independently discovered this hundreds of years earlier, but they didn't know that. And that is you want to, a good photograph, you can divide up into uh, uh, thirds. And I'm going to show you my screen again. And the rule of thirds would say, your principal subject of a photograph should not be in the center. That a perfectly balanced photograph looks very mechanical. And I take a lot of pictures of buildings um, so I take a picture of a building and I want the pink of building to look proportional. So the building's in the center of the picture. And I used to be a photojournalist and if I'm taking a picture of an event, I want that to be in the center of the picture. But artistically, people have decided that uh, it looks better if it's not in the, uh, in the center of the photograph. So in, I, I didn't move her over to a third of the way, but you'll notice that I did move her out of the center back a bit to the left. And I left more space on the right. And this has to do with the rule of thirds. This looks more natural to us than a perfectly symmetrical photograph. A perfectly symmetrical photograph looks poised, looks artificial. Whereas if it's slightly off center, even if you have some extraneous detail in there, uh, it's fine. What would be bad is that Say there was a, uh, in the original photograph, if there was a bright red frisbee here and I chopped out B 
beach behind her, but I left the bright red Frisbee, that would be a distraction. As it, if she and her dogs is the subject of the photograph, by leaving that bright, bright red Frisbee, the eye is drawn to that, and that's a less, uh, that's not as good of a photograph. But the, the general speaking is the rule of thirds, and you want to make sure that things are not absolutely symmetrical and that you have roughly a third of the screen is space to, for the photograph to breathe. So in this case, uh, rule of thirds, you, I can show it here in a not particularly interesting photograph, but it, it was something that appealed to me. Uh, if you look at the photograph that I did of the uh, woman taking a photograph of her baby, in this case, you notice that I don't have any sky, but I've got an awful lot of uh, water here and I've got an awful lot of beach. When I chop them out, tell me which one I paid more attention to. Which one did I give more weight to? The water or the beach? The water. Yes, and you'll notice that the rule of thirds applies vertically because she's pretty much in the center of this one. And I've got beach here and I've got water there. But when I crop it, there's a lot more water than there is beach, and she's now in the bottom half of the photograph. She's, she's basically in the bottom, not quite third, but she's in the bottom part of the photograph. And there's not much space behind her, and there is more space behind the child. So the photograph, her attention is focused on the child, and there's more space beyond the child. And the, the concept for that is rule of thirds. It doesn't have to be exact. You don't need to get out your protractor and figure out how to carve up the, the, uh, the picture, but you want to kind of not have things too symmetrical because they look very poised. Why do people hate their driver's license photographs? Aside from the fact that the person taking the photograph is really bored with taking lots of photographs all day, you are in a fixed space, they tell you to look straight ahead, don't smile, just look as boring as possible, and they think that's a perfect photograph. But their purpose is slightly different. They're trying to catch criminals and things like that. If you're looking for artistry, uh, do whatever, whatever they're doing at the DMV, don't do that and you, you're being in good shape. Um, you don't want it absolutely symmetrical. You want to have some emotion. You want to have um, some kind of color. You can take a black and white photograph, by the way, and have, uh, have uh, I'm gonna show you something something you may not know. I told you that there were tools in, in preview. One of the tools here is adjust color. And if I look at the color of the person and baby and so on and so forth, and I say auto levels, it actually brightened that. You might not be able to tell, but I can brighten the exposure using preview. I can brighten the contrast or, or lighten up the shadows here by doing that. So I'm just, I'm just using preview, not using uh, Photoshop. This is just preview. I tell it to reset and goes back there. But um, um, you can make a, you can make a, uh, I forgot, to, you can have color by turning things into black and white. And this thing doesn't have a black and white setting. But in black and white, what is color? Color is lightness, or darkness that highlights something. So color does not have to mean color the way we think of it. It's just something that catches the eye that's not, not drab. Now in this particular case, in a black and white photograph, what would be the color? The color would be the sun shining off the child's head. It would be the sun on this blanket. It would be the sun on her back. Those would all be brighter images and and we, our, our, our eyes are attracted to that. You wouldn't see that she has a colorful bag, but even in black and white, you know that there had to be colors here. And if you can see colors, you will imagine colors in a black and white. And if you don't believe me, just go watch a black and white film. Just go turn on to Turner Classic Movies or some, actually he colorized all those. Go find some black and white movies on, on, on TV. Watch a black and white movie and your mind will fill in color where it doesn't exist, provided the image itself lends itself to that. But if it's very monotone, it's gonna look monotone.
that's a trick, by the way, that they use in political ads. Uh, um, in political ads, they will um, take uh, a, a perfectly good photograph and they'll rasterize it so it'll be pixelated and people will look grainy and they'll wash out the color because that's a bad politician. And <laughs> that, it's a fairly common technique. And they, they, they've known about this sort of thing for quite some time. I want to go back to these two photographs that I took earlier today. This is, is I'm not using the rule of thirds at all. I'm focusing on the fact that I just think this store has a funny name. And is that a good photograph? For the purpose that I took the photograph, yes. Is it artistic? Not in the least bit. And the same with this sign. Uh, I just took this sign because it definitely caught my attention. But is it colorful? Not really. Uh, is it artistic? Not in the least bit. But is, does, it, does it take the picture that I was looking for? And the answer is yes. So uh, taking a good picture, it's kind of, sometimes it's difficult to, to, to decide what is a good picture and what is a bad picture because it depends upon what you're doing. When I was a photojournalist in Japan, I would take documentarian type of photographs where I would take a picture that would definitely was not artistic. I was at a sumo tournament once and I took a picture of the sumotori, uh, sumotori is what they call the professional wrestlers, walking down a hallway. And it's this dimly lit uh, hallway with this guy wearing his uh, mawashi, which is the belt that goes around uh, the sumotori. And that was it, it was, it was, it looked, like a dingy hallway because it was a dingy hallway. But I was looking at it from the point of view of a documentarian that once they go out in the bright lights, it's nice and shiny, but behind the scenes, it's kind of looks like a locker room, which is what it was. So it depends upon what it is you're trying to do. And sometimes if you think about the, um, the photograph of uh, after uh, Robert Kennedy's assassination in Los Angeles, where it was not a technically good photograph. It's a grainy photograph of this um, uh, food server in the hotel, leaning down over Robert Kennedy with looking up with this shocked expression on his face. Almost everyone who's ever seen that photograph remembers that photograph. It's not a very good photograph, but in terms of documenting that time, it's perfect because it has emotion and it has context. So it, it's really kind of hard to come up with a good hard and fast rule on what a, what a good photograph is. It, does it meet the need that, for which you took it is a good one. Um, and the other thing is make sure that you have adequate light <laughs> and uh, try not to um, move too much. Um, but um, uh, of, of the cameras that I played with today, from my $5,000 Sony to my $600 um, Canon pocket camera to my iPhone, which one is the best camera? Mm -hmm. The one you have with you. The one you have with you. You get an A. <laughs> and for most of us, most of the time, the camera we're going to have with us is going to be an iPhone. And if you don't have an iPhone, you have an Android, well, you have our sympathies, but it's still going to be the, the camera phone that you have with you is going to be the phone that uh, is the best phone. Um, could I have taken the hummingbird picture that I showed at the start with my iPhone? No. If I could get close enough to take a photograph like that of a hummingbird, that hummingbird would be two or three football fields away. It would just be out of, out of there in a flash. So some types of photography are much harder to take using a, uh, using a, uh, a phone. Um, uh, than, uh, than using a, a regular camera. Uh, and some things are fairly easy. Um, I have taken, for example, uh, I don't know how many of you know it, but you can use your iPhone as a magnifying glass. There's an under control center, you can add something called a magnifier. And I use that all the time to look at things like serial numbers and such. Well, if you think about it, you're using your camera for that. You can take really good close up photographs of things with your iPhone. The trick is you have to make sure you have enough light. 
So for example, I took a, I took a photograph of uh, one of the uh, commemorative quarters for Washington State and sent it to somebody on the East Coast. And that quarter completely filled the front frame. So it was a huge quarter that I sent to this person. I was just taking it with my iPhone. I just held it really close, made sure it had lots of light and that quarter completely filled uh, the frame. So you can, you can do amazing things, but you sometimes have to think about it uh, and plan it out. And again, make sure you have lighting and reduce as much as possible vibration. I have a friend who did manage to take a picture of the comet that passed through here a couple of weeks ago with his iPhone. I used his iPhone and a $70 million telescope, but he did manage to take a picture of that comet using his iPhone. Uh, probably not the best camera for that purpose, but the $70 million telescope didn't help. Any other First, questions? I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Have you ever used your iPhone in conjunction with like a Swarovski telescope to take pictures of um, like ducks on water and that sort of thing or birds? No, I haven't, but I did buy a little plastic gizmo that I haven't tried out yet that allows you to use your binoculars or basically as a, as a telephoto lens for use with your iPhone. Um, I, haven't, I haven't tried it yet, um, but um, um, if you go into Amazon, a lot of people have these things that, that are designed to clamp your, your iPhone to yeah. a set of binoculars or to a, a, a monocle. A monocle is basically just a binocular only with one uh, lens instead of two. Uh, or to spotters telescopes. A lot of birders have these clamps that they have spotting telescopes for spotting birds. And this clamp clamps onto the end of it so they can get a nice telephoto image of this bird that they're looking at. I have not done that, but uh, I did buy this little gizmo that's supposed to allow me to do that. I just haven't got around to it yet. Uh, okay. Swarovski, huh? Nice, nice binocular. <laughs> Any other questions? If you want to do a close-up, would you uh, do something on a close-up? Would you use portrait or would you just use the standard lens? Uh, the portrait is actually uh, not a good use for that. And the reason is that the portrait, what it really does is it reduces the depth of field. The depth of field, if you have a, a high depth of field, and if you take a picture from out from here, both my hand and my face would be in focus. If you have a narrow depth of field, you can take a picture of my head where my nose would be in focus, my, my ears would be out of focus. That's a very shallow depth of field. And fashion photography uses a very shallow depth of field. And what the portrait setting on the new iPhones does is it creates a shallow depth of field because that shallow depth of the field tricks the eye into making faces look more three-dimensional. And it's really designed for faces. The portrait mode doesn't work terribly well. People have tried to take portrait modes of birds and cats. And it's just not set up for that. It's really designed for the human face. If you want to take a close-up, the best way to do that is just get as close as you can and play with it. If you have something like uh, on the new phones where it's got different levels of magnification, Mine's got the wide angle, it's got the 1x and the 2x. Try all three, see which one gives you what you want, but just hold it as, as close as possible. When you're doing close up with an iPhone, the other thing to do is to hold it as flat as possible. So for example, if I wanna take a picture of this mouse, I want to hold this as absolutely as flat as possible because if I tilt it slightly, part of, the, part of this mouse is gonna be out loud blurred because it's not flat. You want the object to be, all points on the object to be as close as they can to the camera. And if you tilt it, you're making it parts of it uh, immediately farther away than the other part. So when you're taking close-ups, make sure it's as uh, flat to the subject as possible. Now there are exceptions for things like, if you take a picture, you want a close-up of a bumblebee on a flower, just don't get space down. You know, get in there as close as you can. Don't worry about too much else. It's a gamble. Uh, when you take pictures of bumblebees on flowers, you end up with a lot of pictures of nothing at all. Um, the, the big trick to taking good photographs, take a lot of them. 
the most photographs I've ever taken of one offended was a University of Maryland women's basketball game. It was an NCAA finals game. And I took 5,700 photos in two hours. And quite a few of them were good. A lot of them were terrible. But the only ones I show are the ones that are good. So take a lot of photographs. You don't necessarily need to take 5,000. But keep in mind that right now the film is free. You don't, you're not paying for it. You don't have to go to, you know, Photomat and, and drop your little cute and your rolls into the... One of the other things to think about with, with photographs right today, my... I'll give you a horror story. My niece lost her phone. It was an Android. She lost her phone. Her eldest son at the time was 11. That phone had his baby photos on it. She had never backed them up. So she lost all photos of all three of her children for a span of 11 years because she never backed them up. And in fact, she hadn't even looked at a lot of them. So now she's she got an iPhone and she backs them up to iCloud and all that sort of stuff. But the other thing to note, don't take photographs and then not look at them. You get really good fed feedback now. Don't look at them on your phone. Look at them on your computer. Because on the phone, with the small screen, things might look good. And then when you look at it on, up on your computer screen, you realize it was fuzzy or parts of it were out of focus. You can get immediate feedback. It's not like going to Photomat, taking these photographs. You, you, you fill up the roll of film. You turn it in. You realize that some of the, some of the refrains you took uh, eight months ago you don't even remember what you were doing. You don't remember the names of those people you took photographs of. You can get immediate feedback. You don't have to wait eight months anymore. So when you take photographs, dump them onto your computer and take a look at it and, and say, oh, I, I, I chopped that off or I have my finger in it or that shadow is uh, in the wrong place. If you have immediate feedback, use that to help you take better photos. But the only way to get good feedback is to actually look at your photos as soon as possible to when you took the photos. And I don't mean on this screen, because this screen's too small uh, to really tell you how good the photograph is. Dump it onto your computer. Nice, beautiful computer screen. Take, take advantage of it. Any other questions? What's a good way to get um, pictures off an old uh, Dell PC? that's going to be retired? Uh, the best way is to put them on a flash drive and just kind okay. of drag, drag them to a flash drive and plug the flash drive into your computer. And uh, that's the easiest way. What you, what you don't want to do is to go through some kind of service like Amazon, because if, you, if your Dell backs them up to Amazon, it's backing up a copy, and it's a lower resolution copy. Whereas right. if you drag it onto the flash drive, you got the full size original. Uh, but the, a flash drive is the easiest way. I, I went on to Amazon and I got 10 of these for 30 bucks. And they're each one is, I think, 32 gigs. So it's a lot of space for cheap. Um, using them right now for my church. This, this is our Sunday service from the church on the flash drive. They give me the pieces and I put them together. Um, but no, a flash drive is the way to go for that. Any other questions? I have a question for you. What do we do next month? I have one, one suggestion that we talk about um, Word, which I'm more than willing to do. And somebody last month also said, um, uh, talk about backups. Um, how to use um, Time Machine and other kinds of backups. So uh, those are two. subject for me. So is that a vote for backups? That's one vote anyway. That would be for me. Okay. I'm Time machine. Pardon? Time machine. I, I, I didn't hear that. Time machine. Backups. Oh uh, time machine. Okay, yes. Uh all right. Let's let's try backups for next um, next month.
Um, unless you have other questions, I think we're kind of done. So uh, I want to thank you all. I and hope your mom's going to be okay. Yeah, I'm going to call my spouse in just a second because uh, I don't really know what's going on. Um, so. I have a question. Um, when you transfer your pictures from your phone to your desktop using, what is it, Air, Air, <laughs> um, is it AirPlay? Um, AirDrop. I was, AirDrop. Yes. Um, does the size of the photo, is the quality of the photo diminished as opposed to loading them on a thumb drive? No, if you do air, if you use AirDrop, it's not a photo process. It's just a file transfer process. So it just transfers the whole file. It doesn't modify it in any way, shape, or form. It's identical to what it was on the on the phone. Uh, okay. in, fa in fact, those two signs that I showed you that I uh, photographs that I took today in Port Angeles. That's how I got on my computers using AirDrop. It, it okay. just transfers okay. the whole photograph. Okay, then I'm going to close and we'll see you next month. Good night, thank everybody. You. Uh, thank you very much again. Thanks a lot.